Hi all, welcome to another episode of Training Data, the most rich and compelling data science podcast series on the internet. Uh, with me today, uh, it's actually a real pleasure here, a podcast veteran and data scientist extraordinaire, uh, Nick Weir. Welcome back. Thanks, Ryan. Glad to be here. All right, Nick. So this is something that uh, internal to Cosmic we've talked about for years, even long before you joined the team. And it's, it's really cool to dig into today. So for anyone that's followed our blogs or this podcast series, you'll know that we often talk about three things as it relates to machine learning and geospatial, but then just more broadly, just machine learning uh, applied research in general. We talk about the development of curated labeled data sets, in our case, mainly for satellite imagery. We talk about open sourcing machine learning models and explanations uh, on how to use those models and benchmarking them. And we've always kind of thrown in as a third category, open source software. Uh, and we've really dug in deep on those first two, data sets and models. But ever since our, our beginning, back in 2015, we've always kind of just tangentially talked about software. And it wasn't really until, Nick, you joined the team and you looked at what we were doing and you were saying, A, this is great, but it'd be cool if you had something else. So... That's what we're talking about today. We're talking about our first foray into putting out comprehensive open source software to help run models, something that we call Solaris. So this is super cool. Why don't we just start from the top? Nick, what is Solaris? Yeah, so as you said, when I joined the team and I was trying to get spun up on doing geospatial machine learning research and computer vision uh, applications, I realized how hard it is to get geospatial data overhead imagery into a neural network and then uh, get the labels formatted properly for machine learning, get it back out uh, from the model into something that's usable uh, for analyses and et cetera. And I w realized that there's no really good tool for doing this end to end in a research environment. And so that's what inspired us to uh, build on top of a lot of the tools that uh, we had developed um, and create Solaris. So Solaris is a Python library for performing machine learning analysis on overhead imagery. And it integrates every single step of a geospatial analysis pipeline. It can ingest untiled, totally raw overhead imagery and uh, large format geospatially uh, or georegistered labels and convert these into uh, formats that are compatible with a deep learning model, which needs much smaller images, needs the labels in a different format, and then run the machine learning, take the output from that model and convert it back to something that you can use for geospatial analysis. And also integrates the ability to evaluate how well the model performed, because this is something that's really missing at the moment. It's a standardized way to evaluate models for overhead imagery. And uh, one other, a couple other great things that I should mention, this includes a Python API for people who want to do research using uh, these tools and iterate on models, develop new models. It also includes a simple command line interface for people who are not familiar with machine learning, deep learning, geospatial data analysis, et cetera, and want to just test a model and see how well it runs. Um, finally, we have included the ability to use pre-trained models from the, uh, challenge, the SpaceNet Challenge winners in the past. In the past, we've open sourced the code that they used, but it's often a little bit challenging and time consuming to take that code and, and generate an actual model that you could use for predictions. And so what we've done with Solaris is enable users to use these pre-trained models without having to try to understand how the code gets you there. That's excellent. And I think uh, just to take a step back, uh, on a previous pod, we had uh, the co-founder of Anaconda, uh, Peter Wang on, and we were talking about everything they've done to build out the Python community. We've got a question on this, so I, I just kind of want to address it now. We're obviously a, a Python shop. Uh, given in a nutshell, why we focus this exclusively on Python for geospatial? Yeah, Python is uh, definitely the the most popular uh, programming language for data science today. Um, in particularly in a research environment where you might want to be able to iterate quickly on uh, models or on your approach. Um, 
it's not necessarily the most efficient language. A lot of the uh, really high-end tools are using something else in the back end, like C or C++. But for uh, rapid development of methods, for iterating on analyses, um, Python is definitely the most popular. And so we wanted to use a tool that would be very relevant to the uh, the data science and geospatial community writ large. And there are already fantastic Python libraries for all of the individual components yeah. of Solaris. We are really standing on the shoulders of giants like TensorFlow, PyTorch, Rust.io, GDAL, um, SpaceNet Utilities is a previous tool that we developed for um, doing some of this geospatial analysis that we've really extended with Solaris, and et cetera. Yeah, the, the the gradual mutation and growth of SpaceNet utilities <laughs> over the over the years. So I appreciate on behalf of uh, anyone who's ever used those utilities, thank you for helping clean that up because <laughs> that was a long overdue effort. Um, it, we kind of touched on this, but it, it's worth pointing out in greater detail about how this type of work, so doing some applied research for computer vision, spinning up a model, and then evaluating it, how this was done in the past, because I can tell you, and you know this, but uh, for those of you who, per who have uh, perhaps not as been as hands-on in this domain over the years, is even for Cosmic, right? we had a lot of really kind of cool one-off tools or one-off uh, techniques uh, that each of us on the team had, but that's really hard to scale out, particularly when we're putting out, in our case, through SpaceNet, potentially up to 10 uh, benchmark models a year suddenly that becomes really untenable. So just walk us through in a little bit more detail about how someone would have done this in the past and maybe some of the issues that we ran to just internally as a team of essentially uh, six people working on a, on a pretty focused topic area. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, those at the forefront of this field, this burgeoning field of geospatial computer vision applications uh, probably felt like they're on Apollo 13 trying to jam a square peg into a round hole. It is it's, difficult. <laughs> it's really, really hard to take a image strip uh, that you might get from a satellite imagery provider and a very large format um, vector label file, maybe a GeoJSON with building footprint labels for the entire city of Atlanta, like we get for uh, we got for the SpaceNet MBOI data set. And then find figure out a way to convert all of that into small uh, tiles and tiled labels converted to a, a rasterized mask that you could then feed into a deep learning model to train the model and then get you know, the equivalent rasterized outputs back out and convert this back to something that's uh, that's geo-registered. Geo I think half relevant. the listeners just blanked out. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> just it's even the explanation. It's a brutal process. Tough. And again, this is something that I realized as I got started with the team. And um, every single person on our team, and we also know from looking at SpaceNet Challenge Competitors Code, everyone else in this domain uh, had their own way of doing this, their own individual code that they developed with all the utility functions that you'd need to go from geo-registered uh, vector labels to something for a deep learning model, um, converting the image formats, et cetera. And this made it really hard to compare between models that different people developed or to integrate uh, some of these individual piecemeal tools into a larger product or a larger pipeline because... No one's utility functions worked well with each other. You would have to write a whole nother set of things just to convert between tools. And so what we wanted to do with Solaris is generate a standardized tool set that hopefully everyone can use, uh, that's well documented and clear, and provides all the core functionalities that anyone working in this domain might need so that we no longer need to be inefficient, rewrite utility functions over and over, and also have these uh, have every single developer have tools that don't work with each other. And so we're hoping this will make research a lot more efficient because people won't need to waste time rewrite, reinventing the wheel every time they start a new project, and also will make it much easier to build larger tools that integrate things together. And give some color just as an exemplar, and anyone who's listening, you know, this is a warning here. This may get a little technical uh, beyond our conversation. Give an example of just the complexity that would go into writing some conversion function for something we've done. 
like hi, like just it, it's sometimes hard to talk about these things in abstraction and i think for for us it's almost second hat to do this mm-hmm. now but just highlight the the time it would take uh perhaps for something specific we've done just in the last well when you were doing four for example when you're doing all the eval for four yeah, yeah. So it took me about a month uh, to read through the top 10 competitors model code um, and get everything running in within the same environment so that we could effectively score how well the competitors models uh, worked. And this um, was more or less full time for that full month uh, for me just to read the existing tools that these, that these um, data scientists had developed. And this isn't a problem with their code. Uh, it's it's that everyone had their own um, pipeline, and I had to understand every single one separately. Make sure that everything was producing the same format outputs. Figure out how to get it into the scoring functions. All this kind of thing. I just remember you were in a really dark place, particularly on the scoring function. It part. wasn't that much fun. Yeah. <laughs> well, so we've already talked a, a little bit about the benefits, but walk us through just kind of like a laundry list if you will of things that you know solaris can do that weren't possible before yeah yeah absolutely like the greatest hits here yeah so i think the the number one biggest thing that you can do with solaris now is uh train and run inference um with a pre-trained deep learning model for geospatial data with just three lines of python code or a couple of lines from the command line. Um, this is huge because it'll allow non-practitioners to try out methods, see what the state of the art really is, and test how well models work to see whether or not it'll actually fulfill their their uh, needs for whatever their task uh, or mission might be. Um, so diving a little bit into that, we are including pre-trained models from SpaceNet Challenge winners within uh, that you can pull down uh, with Solaris. Which and ones do we have right now? So right now we have the SpaceNet 4, uh, the um, Atlanta Offnader Building Footprint Extraction Challenge models from uh, XDXD, uh, who is the fifth place participant in the challenge, and three different model architectures that Selimsef used. Okay. And he was the second place participant. In the Shout challenge. out to both of them, by the way. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we're going to take a quick break, and then when we come on back, uh, we're going to be talking about... Uh, how we see uh, Solaris advancing uh, some future research projects and then some efforts that we're planning to do uh, to enhance uh, the open source repository that we have started. Minnesota, the land of 10,000 lakes. It's home to the Golden Gophers, Minnesota Twins, Prince. And what else? There's something I'm missing. Nick, what am I missing? What else is Minnesota home to? State of the map US That's right, that's it. All right. And why does that matter? Because we're going to be there talking about SpaceNet. Yes. Is that it? Is that all we're talking about? No, I think we're missing something again. No, we're also going to be talking about, uh, we're going to have one of my colleagues, Daniel Hogan, there talking about how much data you actually need to train a model uh, for geospatial analysis. That's right. Uh, So last year we were at uh, State of the Map US. It was in uh, Detroit. Uh, awesome experience. Uh, so we're, we're glad to be going back uh, and glad to be presenting uh, two different topics. So make sure uh, t- if you're planning on going to check out uh, both Nick and and Daniel uh, there. And if you uh, have any questions or information, uh, feel free to follow us on our blogs where we'll be uh, posting out more information that we'll be presenting at uh, those con- at that conference. All right. Look forward to seeing you there. And now back to the show. Okay, we're here with Nick Weir talking about Solaris, Cosmic's open source uh, repository uh, for spinning up machine learning models designed for geospatial applications. And as we covered in the first part of the show, this is a big step for us because it's really our first major effort into putting out a comprehensive open source software tool suite. Um, And it's something that I would say it's safe to say we've already gained a fair amount of traction from uh, a pretty dedicated but niche user base. And so we talked what it was and kind of our motivation. So in terms of how we see uh, Solaris advancing research, both internal to our team as well as others in the geospatial community, walk us through some of the things that you see uh, as the major benefits, Nick. 
Yeah, absolutely. So one of the big things that you can do with Solaris is totally standardize pre and post processing uh, of a of an analysis pipeline. And this, as I mentioned in the first portion uh, portion of of this pod, uh, every different person, both within our team and outside had their own process for doing this in the past. And so now uh, this can be totally standardized. Um, people can share their pre and post processing pipelines through a very simple config file. So uh, you no longer need to be sharing enormous amounts of code that may or may not be uh, very clear to the uh, someone who didn't write it in the first place. Um, so standardizing pre and post processing is huge. The config specs, uh, as I just uh, just kind of alluded to, is also big. Now you can use a single configuration file with Solaris that will specify all the parameters for an entire pipeline in a pretty clear fashion. So you can look at it, just look at the config file, know what the pipeline's going to do, and you can easily uh, kind of manipulate, iterate uh, on the process that you're using just by changing a couple lines within this file. That sounds a little too, uh, in a, that sounds a little too efficient for me. I mean, I feel where would all the angst go? If, we'll we'll find somewhere okay, to put our right, angst. Right, Don't right, worry, it'll Just, probably go to Mario Kart. <laughs> um, no and, one can no one can beat Yoshi. Anyways, that's right. right. And so then one more thing that we can uh, do with Solar that we have done with Solaris that's going to be really helpful uh, for the the research community is integrating less common or uh, a little bit niche um, model training tools that are really important for geospatial analysis models uh, that aren't uh, so common in standard, you know, finding dogs and cats in, in a photograph type models, um, and therefore aren't always present in something like PyTorch or TensorFlow. So getting into the weeds a little bit, this uh, includes things like combo loss functions uh, are now available within Solaris and you don't need to write any custom code to get them to work. Um, also really state-of-the-art losses like focal loss, Lavaz hinge, um, a variety of others, and some uh, newer optimizers that aren't currently available in PyTorch and TensorFlow are available with Solaris. So uh, obviously you've put this out uh, through our GitHub channel, but uh, we have SpaceNet 5 coming up uh, launching in the first week of September. This is a great opportunity, right, for both participants who are actually competing in the challenge as well as those who are just following along by perhaps doing their own work, right, to stress test it and to see, A, how it helps, but B, other areas that we could enhance, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we it's an open source project. We really want to have members of the community using the tool for their own uh, purposes, telling us where it's working well and what uh, features they could still use being added. Um, and then uh, finally, we are going to be adding um, a baseline for the upcoming SpaceNet 5 challenge uh, as part of Solaris. We are going to be including the scoring functions that uh, we use to score model performance in uh, the roads challenges, which SpaceNet 5 will be. Um, and so this will hopefully make it a lot easier for competitors to get started in that challenge by providing this set of tools that uh, everyone's going to need and allow them to really focus their time on the actual data science. Got it. And then, uh, obviously, this is still a, a, a new release for us. There's a lot of bugs. Uh, you've been obviously, it's been an active, it's been an active response already. I, nothing makes my day happier, particularly when I open up um, my email box and I see nothing but GitHub updates. Uh, at least 50 e emails deep, no bots. You mm -hmm. responding. That's when I know it's going to be a special day. Um, and I'm curious, as more people start using it and we get more feedback. Um, I feel like I, it'd be remiss if I didn't bring this up now. Uh, are you going to be offering some sort of bounty to the person that either fixes the most bugs or resolves the most issues? And if so, is that going to look like you taking someone out to a free cup of coffee? Uh, yes, I would be more than happy. If someone's in the D.C. area or if they are around any of the conferences that we will be attending, such as Phosphor G International, State of the Map U.S. or others, 
uh, and they fix a whole bunch of bugs in Solaris, or they find a whole bunch of bugs in Solaris for me to fix, <laughs> um, I would be more than happy to buy them uh, a cup of coffee or a drink. So, All right, so then you heard it here first. Um, the rules of this will be, we'll, we'll manage it informally, but if, you're, if you do participate, reach out to Nick and or myself on Twitter, and we'll be happy to respond. All right. That said, all right, so one of the last things we've talked about on the team is um, as we build in more capability, eventually going forward, do we, since this is an open source effort, uh, how do we see this integrating with perhaps other more comprehensive product suites that are focused on machine learning? Yeah, yeah. So we are currently talking with a few companies about how they can leverage Solaris as they're trying to develop uh, geospatial analytic capabilities and how they can build some of those tools on or with Solaris. And so stay tuned for more on that. Yeah, and we'll be uh, hopefully putting out releases as early as September uh, with more information on that. So stay tuned. Uh, last but not least, or second to last, I should say, where can listeners find it? I mean, we've made some references to the sites, but we actually haven't listed them out here. Right. So Solaris, uh, the code base can be found on GitHub, uh, www.github.com slash cosmic. That's cosmic with a Q at the That's end, right. uh, slash Solaris. Um, there, it's also available on PyPy, so you can just pip install Solaris. Um, the documentations are available on Read the Docs, so solaris.readthedocs.io. Uh, we're also going to be running a workshop at Phosphor G International at the end of this month where uh, you're, you, uh, Jake Shermeyer, another a research uh, scientist within our team, and myself will be uh, helping people get spun up with Solaris and how to use it for geospatial analysis. So if you're going to be there, definitely check that out. Um, there There's may, rumors of you making t-shirts. Oh, I, I cut you gonna, off. I Darn it. I say there may or may your, not be thunder. t-shirts for uh, participants. Uh, and then finally, we are going to be expanding our training materials. There are a few tutorials on the uh, Read the Docs page right now. We're going to be expanding those. And then we're also going to be doing videos, screencasts, building out more thorough notebook format tutorials, everything we can do to try to make this as easy as possible for people to use. That's right. And uh, we'll be putting all of that information up in an easy to find format on our new website which will be launching in September. Uh, for those of you who have looked at our website in the past, yes, it does look like something that was created over a weekend in 2015. Uh, Can't so, imagine why that would be. <laughs> that, was, that was the extent of my WordPress skills at the time. Uh, but uh, with uh, much help from uh, uh, Kristen Zender and our marketing team, we'll have that whole site updated, uh, hopefully in the first part of September. And one of the first things we'll be featuring, right, is some of... Uh, the training material that Nick's talking about. Well, uh, Nick, we're looking forward to all that coming out. I'm actually really excited uh, about FOSS and the workshop because it's the first time people can really get hands-on. Anytime anything includes t-shirts or stickers, uh, I'm in. And so I appreciate you taking out some time and talking about this today. Thank you for having me. It's a lot of fun, and I'm looking forward to continuing with this project. Excellent. Well, thanks all uh, for listening today. Uh, please subscribe wherever uh, to us wherever you get your podcast. And stay tuned because next week uh, we'll be having another episode, this time talking with Jake Shermeyer uh, from Cosmic and then Dylan George from uh, IQT's Be Next team. We'll be talking about how uh, we developed an open source tool and use satellite imagery uh, to help estimate uh, population dynamics uh, over, in this case, uh, Puerto Rico after a natural disaster. So stay tuned for that. Until then, take care.